what that leads me to is a question of number of holy shit moments. Hello, everybody. This is episode number 89 of No Putts Given. I'm Miranda, and I've got Chris, Tony, and Harry here with me this week. Guys, Harry, Tony, welcome back. Yes. Thank you. Have you recovered? No. No. Rolling from one thing to another, no respite in sight. That's all right. You know, somebody's got to look at the data, right, Tony? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so last week, Harry and Tony were, in, were at Scottsdale National doing our second edition of the ball test. So this week, they're a little weary at work, but still working very hard. What, what was the experience like, guys? I mean, 12 hours a day putting balls on a tee? Yeah, that was most of it. Lather, rinse, repeat all day long. So I think we worked, I don't know, 50. It's like mid-50s. Or hours was 50 something yeah it was like 12 12 11 11 and a half and then something like that so it was whatever a that is it's all we we both hit about we we're both placed about two and a half thousand balls and orientated on the pole and the seam 2500 times okay show me your form so we got in the <laughs> habit like we tried different things like you move around sometimes it's not comfortable no so Sometimes you're like, all right, I've been sitting too long, so let me stand. Other times you're in the chair and it's kind of like this gentle rock forward. The times you're so beat, you're you're just sitting down and you're like, oh, give me a ball. My back was screaming after the first day. We both took like a couple of painkillers midway through day one. <laughs> I don't know if they kicked in. It still hurt the next day. I mean, it's it's just long days. It's monotony for sure. It's um, one of the guys I know, another media guy, texted me day three, I think, and he was like, "Man, this is so cool what you guys are doing. I would love to do this." And I was like, "No, no you wouldn't. No, you don't." <laughs> it's like one of those things that sounds cool and it's cool for 15, 20 minutes, and and then you realize you have essentially five days minus fifteen or twenty minutes of this left, and yeah. it's like, "All right, well, yeah, let's let's keep the balls coming." Were they tuning into the live cam? Is that how they were like, oh, this looks so cool. This would be great to be a part of. Yeah, I think some of the guys I, I play golf with here have mentioned like they watch a little bit of it here and there. So, you know, people in and out and pretty wild that we we live stream the entire thing. <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing one comment. This guy was like, just said, like, this is boring. I'm like, yeah, no shit, man. Like, we we didn't mean for boring. it to be entertaining. Thanks for the update. Yeah. But yeah, it's not like of. you know the robot hits a ball and when it lands fireworks go off or you know something magical happens it's just <laughs> all right yeah track man beeped yeah but it's those same people who said it was boring that three days later they came back and they're like i've had this on for three days i can't believe that you guys are still there <laughs> what was it like to be on the live cam all week were you aware that you were being filmed the whole time and that people were watching or no. did after a while the camera just became one of the crew I was, was kind of in and out, like, you know, some, just again, you're just like, what, what are you going to live stream everything you're doing? Like, all right, this is our third tailor made. We're going to align this one on this, on the seam. All right, it's on the T. There it goes. All right, this is our <laughs> number four tailor made. We're going to put it on the T, align on the pole. There it goes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's literally, it's, so yeah, yeah it's, you can't do anything. I know we don't have the results of the data, Tony. You're knee deep, probably deeper than knee deep in analyzing the data. But from an eyeball test, what were some of the things that the two of you guys took away from the ball test last week? And maybe have you excited about the data? I think, you know, again, and there's so there's still a lot of work to be done, like to to really understand anything because you're taking data off the track, man, kind of cleaning up silly things like making sure that each ball is identified uniquely and that each shot is unique and and all this stuff that's just, you know, adding to the monotony of what we've already done. So everything we have at this point was, I would say, almost entirely observational, but I think Harry will yeah. agree. Like one of the things, especially early on in the test, we're like, holy shit, this range ball is yeah. really good. <laughs> it's like, yes. You know, I think we got through like the first two driver tests. I'm like, my God, this range ball is actually, it looks pretty good. Maybe you could fit with a range ball. Maybe this is all overblown. And then the iron shot started rolling in. We're like, nope. Yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it, the, uh, it got a little bit different 
when you say it was really good, you mean the dispersion was tight? What about it that made you go, wait a second, this is this is showing me something? When I and I say dispersion, you know, everything with dispersion is looks because you know we mm-hmm. have to kind of we're gonna have to look at the balls within groups to, and, and kind of factor in kind of what we see in terms of tendencies that is likely related to environmental conditions. But yeah, what we saw with the range balls is they were. They weren't short is probably how I would put it, right? They weren't appreciably short. They were landing relatively close together. And so we're like, yeah, these... And the numbers weren't wildly off. They were sort of like, you know, these are actual golf ball numbers in terms of launch and spin and and even ball speed. Then the iron shot started rolling in and you're like, that's that's a lot of spin. Mm -hmm. That is is a non-functional amount of spin. And I will say, and again, we are... Very early in this process, but it's, you know, so I started looking at, I'm like, all right, from a performance perspective, what is, what is similar to the range ball in terms of, yeah, flew a pretty good distance, but you know, looks kind of weird on an iron. And it's, it's actually the Kirkland. I was going to say the Kirkland is probably exactly like that. The Kirkland had a lot of spin off every single club, at least eyeballing it at least. Um, And looking back and forth from the track, man, at least it spun a little bit more, but yeah, I mean, I would play a range ball over some of the balls just by eyeballing it uh, <laughs> over some of the balls that we tested. So what what range ball was it? I was going to say, yeah, we used the the pinnacle range, which is it the most you know, there's, there's a decent one according to the sources. Yeah, it's the one we it's the one we ran through Ball Lab. Yeah. Did you buy them fresh or did you go up to your club and just take a bucket? Oh, uh, they're all they were fresh, clean. all brand new. Okay. Yeah, we got fresh ones, but it's again nobody nobody brags about being the number one range ball in golf, so. You know, we, we can't say for sure that this is the most popular range ball on the planet. General consensus is that it's probably uh, the best. Maybe maybe next time if we do this, we'll test a single piece range ball, <laughs> like uh, just a one piece to see how that goes. Oh, no. But, but we had run it through Ball Lab. We came back like it was, you know, sort of the very definition of average in terms of quality. And so... You know, we weren't expecting to see anything super weird in terms of, hey, you know, where the hell did that go? It was pretty solid, but super duper spinny. What do you learn from testing a range ball? Why do it? So our thinking there was, you know, one, it's it's a curiosity. It's one of those questions that comes up a lot. We know people even steal range balls and play them. But but ultimately, <laughs> kind of what, what makes it a curiosity for me is, I know several fitting locations, you know, a lot of, a lot of sort of off course pro shops with driving range still, they fit with their range balls. And so, yeah, we, we used a, a premium range ball if such a thing exists. And so it was meant to kind of answer the question, can you be fit reasonably well with a range ball knowing that in our scenario, we're, we're talking about under the absolute best case scenario. And so, you know, again, eyeballing the data i can say you might be able to get away with it with a driver here are some things to think about but if you're getting fit for an iron do not do Mm -hmm. not use a range ball and that's that is in the best case scenario so we think about you know your your typical range probably doesn't have brand new premium (laughs) you know or or high quality if such a thing exists range balls so so if you're getting fit bring the ball you're going to play with is your advice correct yeah, and the, well, I mean, it gets super tricky because unless you're willing to bring 50 or 60 of your own balls to get a fitting, mm-hmm. it's it's really difficult in an outdoor environment to be fit with the ball. That's true. Park. That's yeah. true. Here's a question for you. So last time we did this, what, two years ago, um, we really had no expectations. We didn't know what we didn't know, right? I mean, it was you know, kind of more so walking into it blind. And that's not just the house you rented where people were already living there. That's a different story. <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, maybe you can tell that story in a minute. Shout out but to Wendy and Ray. For thanks, Wendy. Ago. Thanks, yeah. Ray. Appreciate the hospitality. Um, what that leads me to is a question of number of holy shit moments. So this time around, how many times did you stop and maybe look at each other or ah. just go, damn. That was wild. In general, less than last time by a fair number. So, you know, the biggest holy shits moments during the the last test were were balls that went hard in one direction. So, you know, right. The issues we had with Chrome Soft are well documented. I, I tell people about a Mizuno that duck hooked. And we didn't, like, we had balls go left and right. But I wouldn't say, you know, other than, than one or two that were clearly well left or right of the pattern at that time. Mm-hmm. 
we didn't have like those, you know, that ball is off to in oblivion. Well, I mean, we, we got to negative nine, negative 10 spin axis on a couple of shots. And some of them were within the sevens to nines as well. So I would say... What does that mean, Harry? For people, people yeah. won't get spin access and numbers positive, negative. Yeah, so it's it's basically left. It's exactly what Tony's doing. It's a plane. So if you're Tony, show us a zero. Zero is flat level. Okay, show and us then, show us negative two. This is my negative two. So you might have to mirror it depending yeah. on what. Zero okay, is. Yeah. Yeah. and they'll show us negative nine. <laughs> and actually, I mean, obviously, that's well right. exaggerated. That's way more than nine degrees, but right. So negative is going to be left on a right. track man. Negative is left. So that means, in terms of like a golf ball, if it's flying forward, it's as to it's it, does it turn this way versus fly straight? Yeah. Is that what I'm okay. yeah. right? So basically, we were seeing it. We have our target line down the um, the driving range, and the, the driver starts the ball on that target line. But some of the negative spin axis that is like negative nine, negative 10, it would start left to target and then draw or power draw left. From where we're looking at it, it looked a long, long way. It looked like 50 yards left, but it's not going to be 50 yards left. It might be 20. When you look at the data, we, we don't know until we dive into it, but it looked a long way left after looking at ball after ball going down the center line and we, we we can really see which ones go left and which ones go right yeah gotcha. we saw like like last time we had balls landing we had a couple land upwards of 30 left and mm. i think i don't think we had any we didn't have anything that like that, far no. left this time. so does that mean that balls are getting better from a performance standpoint like the, the over the last two years companies have kind of figured it out a little bit i mean it's a broad stroke Maybe. but for better or worse, right, the, the number of total holy shit moments were, were way down. And in fact, we didn't really start seeing them until we we ran our little you know, labs. We decided to, to pull together like a, an aerodynamics lab. And I think we'll we'll pull everything together. And it was basically we we put some mud on some balls and we yeah. uh, we scraped off some dimples and we did, you know, tried to simulate some cart path damage and all that stuff mm -hmm. to try and understand. Never play a cart bath ball. Never. Holy crap. Yeah, it was it was pretty wild. So Harry took one and, and tried to replicate, you know, hey, this hit the cart path pretty hard. Where it's like you can see some scrapes, but it doesn't look terrible. And and we teed that up and we we kind of tracked where we had it. So we put the scrape essentially where we would hit a ball that was on, you know, our seam strike. And it turned hard, hard left. And so hmm. we're like, okay, yeah, it's it doesn't take a lot. The theory and the myth about mud balls if the mud is on the left of your ball it's gonna go right okay the theory holds true so say the scuff is on the right of the ball it's gonna go left it goes opposite direction of, it goes the yeah. opposite of where the defect is the uh, right. the aerodynamic impediment <laughs> Ooh, that's fancy so we put one on top and it basically, re it went straight, but it reacted like the ball was getting knocked out of the air by the wind or the wind knocked it down, something like that. So it really just went like that and came down because it didn't have enough spin to generate um, it staying in the air for a longer period of time. So everything we're talking about now in terms of range balls, refurb balls, mud balls and everything are labs that we did in addition to the necessary test mm -hmm. of every manufacturer ball that we put through the test. So we we had some myths and questions we wanted to either debunk or answer. Um, in one of those tests, you put some balls in a freezer, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How um, did those do? It, it so like it's, it's, it's funny. So I had done some quick experimenting before I left, just as a curiosity, because we know that temperature impacts compression. And so what I did before I left was I measured a single ball and I put it on the compression tester and that came out right at 100. But I'm like, good, that's easy. I don't even have to, you know, I'm not carrying any ones or anything. I can handle this. And so then I stuck it under, you know, I have a heat lamp on my range hood and the idea is like, all right, what happens if this ball bakes in the sun for eight minutes? And it's probably, you know, it's more like Arizona sun, you know, direct heat. So straight from the freezer to or two separate No, months? no, this was this was still this is room know, temp, sort right? of room temperature okay, to gotcha. it. So I, I left it for eight minutes, the idea being, hey, if, if you're the guy that hits the bomb, it may be eight minutes before you hit your ball again. So 
So I took that ball and measured it again, and it was down to 90 compression. So ten? 10 compression points from baking for about eight minutes. And so, you know, everything we say that at this point says, all right, that ball should be a little bit slower. And that's I don't know how much, yeah. but a little bit slower. Just eyeballing it. That's what we saw. Yeah. Then I brought it back to room temperature, threw it in the freezer for 10 minutes and measured that. And it was at 106. Oh, so once it's been heated and then back to room temperature and then frozen, it changes the compression even more. So, yeah. So it goes the other way. And I was like, so my theory is frozen a little bit faster. Again, compression and speed, there is typically a very tight correlation. Now, what we did... I mean, part of your theory works. It, yeah. it just didn't quite quit. What we did was put <laughs> several balls in the freezer in the morning. And then we, we took them out in the afternoon and they had like ice and it's really cool. We got some really cool pictures of like ice and crystallized. So it, it was like the sort of the frozen equivalent of overcooking the test. We thought, well, this this will be really interesting. And I thought, man, these balls, frozen solid, are going to fly for a mile. And that is not what happened. Interesting. What did happen? The theory of Tony's was true regarding ball speed. So ball speeds jumped up by a couple of miles an hour from what I remember. But distance was seriously short. It went nowhere. What are the, did the spin just not exist? So yeah, yeah you know, like well, just I, knuckleballs, right? It could well be to do with the aerodynamics of the ball. Because you're not supposed to hit frozen golf balls. They, they're they not designed to be hit frozen. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what changed. You know, it was... It was weird. But you, you, like, they were definitely firmer. That was very, very clear from the sound they were making <laughs> when we hit them. Like, hitting the range ball in the hitting bay was unpleasant. Hitting the frozen golf balls made made a range ball probably... Sound really you know, nice. Like, a, like Nike Sasquatch unpleasant? Oh, so bad, just... So yeah, that was that was a goofy thing we did. That. <laughs> what about the um, refurbs? Because we always preach don't play refurbished balls. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't have the the concrete data yet. We're still working on it. But just from your observations that you took away oh, at the testing gosh. facility with the robot. All right. Yeah, I, I mean the the obvious thing is the ball speed. So it was tragic. You would expect. Nah, I would say the obvious thing without even hitting a bloody ball was the look and condition of them was horrendous. All right, what, which refurbs are we talking about? Titleist Pro V1s. Specifically. Okay. Reloads yeah, from this. The reload brand. So basically, you have a Pro V1 and you're using it and you say you have a gash in it. You cut, It's a cut in their ball. All right, you don't play it. Well, that just goes back to wherever the factory is and gets painted over, restamped, and then said refinished. Where do they get these balls from, though? Like, I'm not sending... Yeah, do like people mail them back in? Like diving into lakes or what? You go find them. I'm sure like like everywhere else, right? Divers, pickers, yeah. finders. Probably everywhere and anywhere you can think of. I've never bought a refurbished golf ball. I just sort of assumed that they would look kind of new because they've been refinished. And no. It was, hey, let's just, whatever the blemish is, let's just paint over it. Like, does Interesting. Does not matter. So. There was some that looked like a, like a 13 year old boy with pimples all over it because it looked like it was baked in the sun and it had little pimples everywhere some had huge scuff marks uh it's just just based on that i was not ever play them and then we and then we hit them and and we saw and. very spinny <laughs> ball speeds very low ball speed was the thing like was there any consistency because i'd imagine that every reefer ball is different right could yeah. you see any consistency um, that's hard to say yeah i'd have to peek at it but the the big thing to me was that the there is a strong correlation between compression and ball speed. And so we know we know what the compression is of a Pro V1. And we know the compression uh, and we know that, you know, all the balls that are similar to the Pro V1. And so we would, in terms of compression, and so we can assume that that ball speed is very similar. And that's typically what we see. Okay. And then you see a refurb <laughs> Pro V1 and the ball speed is much more similar to a lower compression ball like a like a chrome soft x or a q star tour rx rxs that kind of thing so it was huh. on paper and again i i brought them home i'll throw them on the compression tester when i have some time but on paper it's a mid compression ball that produces the ball speed of a lower compression hmm. ball and so you're like well that's that's weird hmm. be interesting to measure them see what we're working with cut them and then you know, see if we can explain why. But the most yeah. interesting thing is just obviously looking at it by placing a ball on a tee for 2,500 shots um, and then watching the other 2,500 shots. 
I would say the big question that everyone's probably asking, is Chrome Soft better? And visually... I should let you host this show because that was one of my well, next questions. Well, there you questions. go. Boom. Sheepers. But visually, they seemed a lot better compared to the 2019 um, test. They didn't go wildly okay. offline. Yes, there might have been a, a, a squirrely one here and there, but we saw that with quite a few little manufacturers. So yeah, I mean, it's... they seem better, which is the main question. Just on the eyeball just test, on the, yeah. Yeah, we haven't even looked at the data. But just yeah, an definitely, eyeball. Definitely pass the eyeball test. As you're hitting them, right? You're kind of peeking at the track man and looking at the dispersion patterns. And, you know, if anything, we had probably, we had like a single CSX that was a little squirrely. And I'm not going to worry about a single ball from every, anybody mm -hmm. at this point. But I like this word, squirrely. Me too. When you say squirrely, does it mean it's going just not where it's supposed to? Yeah. A little left, a little right. Yeah, kind of leaky. I'm trying to figure out, like, how do you kind of take a look at the entirety of the pattern and, you know, what was going on at a given time in the test weather-wise and determine, you know, did that ball have some squirrel in it? So what, what's the squirrel <laughs> factor? So The squirrel coefficient. Tony, for you, obviously, we would have to look at the data, but the most disappointing ball for me was the TaylorMades. It, it mm. seemed that it wasn't consistent based on when we hit one, we looked at the track man, we looked at the dispersion on the track man, whether we can correlate that to weather or whatever is a different matter. But based on eyeballing it, it, there was some left, some right, some short, some long. It wasn't anywhere near a tight dispersion of what we're used to seeing with other manufacturers. Yeah, I think with, with the TaylorMades in particular, it's, I mean, something was noteworthy almost about, you know, we yeah. tested three balls. And so Harry was right for sure. I mean, there was, we did see a little bit of squirrel in the TP5. How much squirrel on a scale of one to 10? Are we at like a nine squirrel? It was enough to be like, oh shit, <laughs> we should go get that ball. So at least like a seven and up of squirrel. And it wasn't just once, it was pretty consistent seeing that ball. Yeah, there, there's some squirrel in that. And again, we'll see you know, once, once I crunch the data and go, where is, where is the pattern for this? This squirrel incident, where was the rest of the pattern? Was this something that was sort of moving against the pattern at the time? And that's that's kind of how I'm gonna approach this. But so that was interesting. We saw some squirrel there. I was I was really surprised by exactly like how much spin we saw mm -hmm. off the TP5. Okay. Um, and that's again, this is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just observationally for that category, I think it's it's probably one of the spinniest balls in you know, and, and I guess that category is sort of legitimate tour ball. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, and again, neither good nor bad. It's just a, from a performance perspective, one of the highest spinning, probably the highest spinning among a ball brand that a serious golfer should contemplate playing. Um, okay. so that's probably how I would phrase that. If you're a low spin golfer, that might be a ball that you need that spin. So it might perform yeah. well for you. So. Right. And then the other one, the the tour response, mm. Taylor Maid's you know, that's that's their low compression feel preference. Urethane, but yeah. Lots of squirrels. A lot of squirrels. I would say that that it's sort of the opposite where it borders oh. on super duper low spin. Mm -hmm. And again, mm. eyeball just starting to look at the data, but that one was one where off the mid speed driver maybe where, you know, we were typically in the 23, 2400 range. You know, I might have seen a couple like 1900s. So, you know, maybe wow. the only ball that kind of dipped below 2000. So, and again, that, that can work, especially like if you're, if you're a faster swing speed guy who just really, really wants a softer ball, you look at that and go, all right, you know, maybe that super duper low spin can help you overcome the compression penalty a little mm. bit. So lots of give and take. Hey, I've got a question. Were there any balls that, because we tested driver, iron, and wedge, were there any balls that did significantly better with the driver or any of those three than they did with the, the other clubs? That's really tough to say, just because it's it was so many shots. It's hard to really compare just by seeing it. So ask that question again when we have the data yeah. is your answer. Okay. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, what I would say based on a, on a cursory look at the data, Right, we know that that the golf industry in general has a a tendency and and probably a tendency born of necessity to oversimplify concepts. So, 
you know, when, when you think about how a golf ball gets described, it's by a launch and spin attribute, right? It's, it's high launch or it's low launch or mid launch. And it's, you know, the same for spin relative to something that they don't necessarily tell you. And so one of the things that kind of having moved on from the squirrel factor of, of last year, last time test to kind of look at individual metrics and, and really see what pops. The one thing that stood out to me was, and this is at the high swing speed. So I postulate, and I could be wrong that what's the high swing speed, 115, right? 115 mile an hour driver swing speed Okay, is typically that's where you see the biggest separation. And so from the highest launching ball to the lowest launching ball, Give me a guess. What do you think? What's the difference? In 115? Yep. Um, I'm going to say the biggest separation is six degrees of launch. Harry, you got a guess? I would want to say three. What do you got, Miranda? I plead the fifth, so we'll go five. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the correct answer is 0. 0.6 degrees. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think Holy it's shit. that big of a so, difference. So it's literally one tenth of my answer. <laughs> yeah, and so you know when I when I think about this, Miranda Miranda's hair starts to fall out when I start talking about box box and whisker plots. But please you know, just I'm, don't put it in the article, I'm, and we're fine. Well, I know. I'm sure I can generate some box and whisker plots that would show some statistical significance, but somewhere in that 0. 0.6 degree range. And again, you know, tour players super duper discerning. So right. you know that that 0. 0.6 probably means something to them. But I do, as I started to look at other numbers, like, you know, so we get some really cool stuff from TrackMan. So, you know, we get peak height, which we get everything. But TrackMan also tells us how far downrange a ball achieved the peak height. So, you know, did it go like this? Did it kind of fly more like that? And that's where you really, where you do see some differences is hmm. what was the peak height? How far downrange was that peak height? And then what was the descent angle? So there are discernible differences to be to be found there, but it really I think the right word is trajectory versus versus launch. But if you mm. if you put trajectory on a golf ball box, uh, you're going to have probably a good healthy percentage of your buyers. <laughs> yeah, it's four it's four syllables. You got no chance. Like after two. Yeah. Okay. Trajectory, great. But how does it launch? And and the the answer <laughs> appears to be it launches the same as every other ball in terms of just that initial kind of that takeoff. So Tony, this leads me to a question though, and you you alluded to this a little bit with the oversimplification of the industry, and and sometimes that's really good, right, to take a complex you know concept and make it simple and understandable and relatable. But you know, I feel like on commercials lately, and really within the last two three months, maybe you're seeing ball manufacturers talk about this idea and and like Taylor made says there's one ball that's better for all that's kind of their tagline now right and and Callaway saying something similar around you know kind of better for, better for everyone. every shot or whatever yeah whatever it was i think you went into it on the last episode kind of why that irks some of us just from a historical standpoint but from a consistency and data standpoint what do you make of ball companies going that route? And is that something that we can fairly evaluate potentially based on the data around us? Because this seems like an oversimplification to me that at face value feels a little bit nefarious. I mean, it's it's absolute nonsense. Like, And again, I will tell you based on but what I've seen in Ball Lab, right? That's my baseline in terms of quality right. and consistency. Ball Lab, there, there are no environmental factors with Ball Lab, right? You don't have to worry about wind. From baseline in Ball Lab, I can tell you confidently that, you know, if you were talking in terms of a, an entire lineup, Titleist makes the highest quality ball. There's there's no doubt in my mind. There's, there's literally nothing I believe in more in the equipment world than that simple statement. Ooh, I'm, can I get that on a plaque? But within that, that, that doesn't mean ever that a Titleist ball is, you know, better for everyone. Because, again, looking at, at the variety of launch conditions and, and, you know, again, if you want to talk about the total impact of dimples, compression, and the relationship between layers, that's what gives you your launch spin and your speed. There are niches, there are places in the bell curve where, where a Titleist ball isn't going to be the best. You know, the Titleist will tell you we can do a pretty good job or a really good job of fitting everybody. But if you're looking again, so a guy who would legitimately fit into something like a Kirkland, right? Mm -hmm. Titleist doesn't make that ball. Something, right. Somebody who legitimately fits in a tour response, Titleist doesn't make that ball. And there are situations where left dash, right? Right. 
there are companies who make pretty good balls and balls that fit a lot of golfers. They don't make that ball. They don't make, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, you know, they're, they're just dots on a chart and they're kind of all over the place. And you can say, yeah, most people are here. And so, yeah, if you're kind of one of the most people, chances are, you know, you're, you're going to be in that pro V one window and it's, it's going to be tough to beat that certainly from a quality perspective. And unless you're really looking for something super nuanced, you, know, you may not be able to discern the performance difference, but that's the guy yeah. right in the meaty part of the bell curve. Once right. you start up and yeah, down right and towards here, the right edges, there. like that's... That's what I would say yeah. when it regards to, to seeing balls go offline and get different spin rates, blah, blah, blah. The higher swing speed golfer is going to see more of a drastic change in dispersion spin distance between ball to ball, depending on what Absolutely. it is. When it comes sure. to the middle swing speeds you don't see as much in the slower swing speed. You don't see that uh, enough for mm-hmm. it to really matter. So that's what I was seeing during the test is obviously the faster you swing it, the, the ball really is more important than anything for faster swing speeds. Now, when it comes to middle, yes, it is important, but it's not as important and slower is the same yeah. kind of thing. Obviously, if, you, if you've if got a Kirkland and it's spinning like 6,000 off a three iron, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good ball. Good, bad, or otherwise, speed always accentuates your differences. Yeah. Let me tell you one su- most surprising ball in the test for me and Tony, I guarantee for Tony too, was the Titleist Tour Speed. We were like, why is this going straight and long and consistent? Just obviously looking at it from hitting ball after ball from the Tour Speed, we were like, holy crap, this is really, really good. Yeah, Tour Speed was one that kind of caught me by surprise because it was hanging with with what you would expect to be kind of the the best balls in the test and i think you know i my surprise and harry's surprise and anybody else's surprise is probably on titleist because to a degree to to sort of you know put that where they put it in the marketplace to to try and hit a price point and say yeah you know this ball is is as good as our competitors' offerings, but it's not really as good as our premium cast urethane because offerings. Because it's so an injection molded. molded. This one, exactly. Yeah. Saved a little money injection molding like a lot of our competitors do and sort of expected it to perform like, you know, sort of a, a lower tier ball in anybody else's manufacturing in any other lineup. Because that's, that's, that's something we see a lot in Ball Lab too, where, you know, I would say, for example, Bridgestone, Tor BX, and Tor BXS. Uh-huh outshine rx and rxs and certainly with Strixon, you know z star outshines q star right and and that sort of thing and so you know with with tour speed in particular it's sort of well it's you know where does it really fit and so they arguably did a better job with tour speed than maybe you expected or or almost maybe they wanted to in a way yeah like, i mean <laughs> maybe it's yeah it's a happy accident yeah. Well, I think tour speed was kind of almost necessary because AVX is their low compression ball. Right. And AVX is very, very weird mm-hmm. in its space. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. We're going to revisit the ball test uh, once we have the results and we can really break it down to you from a datacratic point of view. But while we wrap up this discussion, Harry, Tony, I want to know your biggest takeaway from the trip to Arizona. It can be to ball test related, my golf spy career related what's what was your biggest thing that you came home with uh i would say <laughs> one week less of my life <laughs> <laughs> scottsdale national is like a carpet it is phenomenal it's just mm. it's it's like a just a wonderland it's disney world for golf it's just so cool um when regards to the ball test my mind hurts just thinking about putting another ball on a tee uh, is is a painful experience of mine, and I might need to go see someone <laughs> about it. Sign Harry up for therapy. But just until you see it firsthand, how good some of these manufacturers are at getting consistent ball after ball, and the same ball flight, the same spin within like a really acceptable number. Until you see it, you don't believe it. You can be told time and time again, but until you really see it you're like, oh shit, why would I ever think anything different about playing another ball brand? Tony, how about you? What was your biggest takeaway? I just wanted to go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess it's it's one of those things where because of, of what we have to do, because of, of what our readers want to see, 
right? They they want to see the Kirklands in the test. They want to mm-hmm. see, you know, we we tested. I want to say thirty seven models. Yeah, I want to say that's. Better. And you know, if if we could give the readers everything they absolutely wanted to, we you know probably have had to test seventy. And I'm just like, man, I sure wish we could really just dig in and focus twelve. <laughs> so like, it's it's sort of the if you want to lump that into kind of a takeaway, it's just like the magnitude of what we do is it just it creates a lot of hurdles, and we man, we we fight hard to overcome them for sure. It's great for the consumer, and we learn a lot from it too. Yeah, absolutely. My takeaway is first, congratulations on a job well done to the two of you, but. Um, I was supposed to be there and unfortunately last minute wasn't able to go, um, but my role would have been to manage the content team. And so I just want to give a shout out to Bennett and Matt for making sure that all of our readers and consumers got to observe the test as closely as you could, because I think a lot of times it goes unsaid the number of hours that we put behind all of our tests. So I'm glad as boring as people thought the live stream was that they were able to tune in and check in with you guys and really see the extent to which we dedicate ourselves to testing. So that was one of my biggest takeaways. Job well done to the content team. Um, and also a big shout out to Will, the engineer. Mm-hmm. I think he deserves a really big hug. <laughs> he probably needed one too. We're getting some package put together for you because... The five thousand shots to watch it was just why, why, why? Yeah, I mean, Will Will was a rock yeah, star. He awesome. he knew after kind of the the planning call, he knew what he was getting into, and he didn't quit before the test. So yeah, that's a guy, <laughs> man. <laughs> so just like, all right, game on. So yeah, he yeah. he gritted out with us every step of the way. And so, so big so. thank you to Will. Um, and so like I said, we're gonna revisit the ball test once we have the data. But guys, thank you. Welcome back to Tony and Harry. Uh, We missed you while you were in Arizona. So until next time, we out. What category of equipment would you vote off the island? So I'm Jeff Probst, and this is Tribal Council. We're just doing one. (laughs) Harry wants to eliminate everything. I know, right? Stop.